Black lights and booze burn when I record for watch and every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot. Welcome to Left to Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal, and we are blessed today to have Professor yes, Regina Bradley, <laughs> who is Assistant Professor of African American Literature at Armstrong State University in Savannah, Georgia. That's what I do. She is also an alumna of the Nasir Jones Hip Hop Fellowship at Harvard mm -hmm. University with Marcelina Morgan and skipping them. And she's the author of the forthcoming Chronicling Stankonia. Outcast in the Rise of Hip Hop in the South, which is on the Contract University of North Carolina Press. How are you doing today, Regina? I'm good. How are you? I made it. <laughs> I'm on left and black. Hey, mama. <laughs> so let's start with this. Um, your work is doing an interesting kind of duality, I think, right? Your work is forcing us to pay attention to the South and hip hop. That's right. Right? Mm -hmm. now, and not just hip hop in the South, right? right. right? Not how hip hop coming from the South sounds, but actually to pay attention to a Southern presence mm -hmm. in hip hop, right? That's the first part. first part. But you're also making Southern studies pay attention to contemporary blackness, right? Because, yes. you know, blackness has always been a part of Southern studies, yes. right? But when you talk about a kind of contemporary urban black experience, we don't normally think about that within the context of nope. Southern studies. So talk about this kind of double move that your work is making. I just want to do all of that. This would be like, <laughs> next question. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so I mean, like my work makes people uncomfortable because I force folks to think about Southern black folks after the Civil Rights Movement. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you think about the Civil Rights Movement, oh, that's modern black South. And I'm like, I wasn't around during the Civil Rights Movement. Most of the people that I hang out with weren't around during the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, where do we fit into this conversation? And then the second part of that is, um, especially in Southern studies, I'm making folks mad because it's like, oh, well, why don't you include uh, some of these other white folks that are talking about black folks in the South? Why don't you include Faulkner or Flannery O'Connor? And I'm like, <laughs> Yeah, no, they had nothing to do with me or this particular <laughs> South that I'm experiencing. So to decentralize white folks from a Southern black experience is just really making folks uncomfortable, which is what I'm trying to do. It, you know, and it's interesting, right, because you think about if, if we take this back 20 years, 25 yeah. years, yeah. and think about 1990s R&B, mm -hmm. right? And we think about 90s R&B as almost like the epitome of this upscale, you know, respectable version of musical blackness. Right. But L.A. Reid and, and Kenny Edmonds, they set up their base in Atlanta. Atlanta. Right? Mm -hmm. Teddy Riley's coming from Virginia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Jermaine Dupree's coming from Atlanta, right? The world has recirculated from this New York, Los Angeles moment, right? Because mm -hmm. at some point, even Whitney and Bobby Brown. <laughs> Right, are in Atlanta, right? Right, right? And folks don't pick up on that as being resonances of Southern culture, right? right. So everything that goes forward, so that whether we're talking TLC, Usher, mm -hmm. uh, Outkast, obviously, right? I mean, mm -hmm. this is all about the contemporary South, even if it isn't recognized as that more broadly, you know, to national audiences. Yeah, I just really think that, you know, we have to complicate what was going on during that time period mm -hmm. and actually kind of recognize Atlanta, especially. Because um, Atlanta is starting to become like this. This is a transient city, right? They right. get the, the Olympics it's and cosmopolitan, all of that. right? It's cosmopolitan, cosmopolitan South, right? You know, we want people to come and, and, and stay and see us as you know reputable folks, particularly reputable Black folks. When I um, talked to Fredera Hadley uh, and Maurice Hobson, right, they made a really good point about um, how the music wanted to reflect a particular type of Black middle class respectability because Atlanta has the AUC. You have these pockets right. of old Black money, right. and then on the flip side of that. You know, hip hop is like, yeah, no, we're not necessarily going to just feed into this particular type of aesthetic. So you have the folks like Goody Mob mm -hmm. who are talking about the Red Dogs police program in Atlanta, who are talking about working class black folks, who are talking about drug addiction, who are talking mm -hmm. about the hustle, um, the trap. Um, before we really kind of marketed the trap in a particular type of way. Um, and it really just complicates this idea about what black urbanity does in terms of how we recognize what southernness is, um, how we recognize how class functions, uh, how gender functions in these spaces, and also kind of forcing us to recognize that indeed there is such thing as an urban south. So like when Imani Perry was talking about it, and prophets of the hood, she was kind of pointing at it. And what I'm trying to do with my work is really bring that to the forefront to kind of guide these other conversations that are taking place to match the cultural production that's coming out of the South in this current moment. 
You mentioned Outcast. You know I love them. Um, and we could talk about your outcasted conversations we going can. back two or three years. Yeah, yeah. Um, we can talk about your Stankonia book, right, for folks yeah, who don't know specifically the reference. <laughs> um, but of course, you're also offering a course on Outcast at Armstrong State this semester. Everything's coming um, up, Gina. It's great. You know, talk about <laughs> thinking about offering that class, what you expect students yeah. are getting out of it. Yeah. Um, and what has been the response from the world, if you will? You know, even, you know, if we were to bring, you know, Dre and Big Boy into you this conversation. You can't even do that to my life because I'm not prepared for that <laughs> type of interaction. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I, I was thinking about having the class. I actually um, had an outcast unit first that I taught uh, when I was at Kennesaw State. Um, that was a class about American identities looking at a hip hop mm -hmm. South. Um, and then uh, what happened was I was assigned to do a special topics in African American literature class and my chair was like, so what do you want to teach? And I'm like, I want to teach class on Southern hip hop with a focus on outcast. Um, to stay on the book schedule, I know you, if anybody can know the book grind, right, you know right, the book grind. Right. Uh, so then I, I get it approved and I have a student um, Kiara Magia, who was like, um, I want to do an interview in the school paper about the class. And I'm like, okay, cool. Um, and I just gave her my little responses. This is the class about outcasts. We're thinking about contemporary Southern blackness, how they update yeah. that conversation, yada, yada. The legend goes that Big Boy's auntie still lives in Savannah <laughs> and saw the article and passed it to him. And then he posted it on social media because, you know, it's not on social media, it's not real. Um, and that's when folks were like, local, like Savannah uh, media was like, oh, we'd like to interview you. Right. Um, so I did another interview, and then this is in December, and I heard nothing. Right. I was like, oh, okay, it's cool. Maybe they, you know, something else was going on. Um, and then on my birthday, January 5th, um, they released the article, or I see the article, and the next thing I know, I'm that Savannah teacher who's teaching about Outcast. Outcast. Um, and the response has been overwhelming. Um, being viral is a lot of work. <laughs> um, and just being, you know, just really seeing that there's, there's space to have this type of conversation. A lot of folks have said that I've, I've touched a nerve. Yeah. Um, and it's been great so far. I mean, every day in class, we listen to a little bit of Outcast. We have these critical conversations about, um, well, at the point, we're kind of talking about Atlanta and urbanity at the moment. Right. Um, so kind of looking at uh, Southern hip hop journalism, so the Rodney Carmichaels and the Christina Lees and Gavin Godfrey's really dope straight out of Stankonia. Um, also looking at uh, Maurice Hobson's work mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, this idea um, or the myth of the black Mecca as Atlanta, in Atlanta. Right. Um, and then we're about to start uh, Kiese Lehman's book, Long Division. Um, you know how I feel about Kiese, that's my, that's my cousin. Um, and uh, how he how he uses um, Aquimini, a line from Aquimini on the Aquimini album to start the book, right. right? Twice upon a time there was a boy who died, right? And how outcast type of storytelling impacts layman's kind yeah. of storytelling and putting those in conversation with each other. So yeah. pairing the musical text with the critical text, the literary text, the cultural text to really give students an interdisciplinary look at how ideas of Southern blackness have shifted over the last 20, 25 years. What do you say to folks, right? And, and this is something that, from the moment anybody decided to teach a hip hop studies class, right? right. It's the same question that Dyson's answering mm -hmm. 25 years ago, Todd Boyd, Trisha Rose, they're all answering the same question right. 25 years ago, that someone will ask you tomorrow, right? Or probably. the day after that. Or has already asked um, me, probably. You know, you hear a class about hip hop and you know, there's always somebody that's gonna roll up to you, it's like, do you teach people how to rap? I mean, you get all these yeah, kind of ridiculous yeah. questions. And particularly in the environment where we are in now, mm -hmm. right, where higher education is seen as something that's elite, mm. right, that, that, that students aren't learning the kind of skill sets that's going to translate into them having sustainable lives economically and otherwise. Right, right. What do you say to folks who are asking, why are you teaching this class now? What do you expect students to get out of this? I mean, I really just came like, I'm gonna do what I want, but that doesn't seem to work right. for people. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so one of the reasons is, I'm a Southerner, I'm from Albany, Georgia, right? right? Um, I have my receipts, I have the PhD, I've done the Nas Fellowship. I mean, like, I, I feel like I'm in a place where um, I can actually start to really interrogate yeah. ideas of Southerness. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the first part of that question would be, I'm a Southerner in hip hop studies, there is very limited scholarship on what role the South plays and how we think about hip hop. Oftentimes it stays in New York or goes to the West Coast. Right. Um, and I'm like, well, what about those of us 
<laughs> who don't experience any of those right. things, In between. Right? right? Um, so you know, shout out to Portia Moltsby because she kind of challenged me before I recognized that she was challenging me. Um, because I was like, well, what about the outcasts and the goody mobs and the Pastor Troys and the UGKs that were in my car at the time? And she was like, yeah, well, what are you going to do about it? And I was like, I don't know at the moment. Um, but that's the one reason. The second reason is that um, you have these conversations about iconic hip hop acts, right? Um, the Nas's, the you know, Little Kim's, the Wu-Tang Clan's, um, and no conversations about Southern artists. So it's almost like the Academy is playing catch up in a similar way mm. that hip hop played catch up in the late 90s mm -hmm. and, and 2000s. And one way to really start that conversation is with Outkast, because Outkast was the first to be visibly recognized on a national hip hop stage at the Source Awards, to be booed off of hip hop mm -hmm. stage at the Source Awards, and then remix that to be like, we don't need y'all, the South is a legitimate space, right. when they literally sampled themselves getting booed on the Quimini album mm -hmm. on Chunky mm -hmm. Fire. So it's yeah. kind of like, they've done all of these remixes and, mi and representations and re-representations of Southern black life that remove the physical boundaries of Southernness yeah. in ways that are extremely interesting and useful for thinking about, you know, current acts of Southern hip hop right. um, that don't have to worry about that hyper-regional, uh, you know, focus in who they say that they are. Um, and also um, how the South kind of transcends physical regions into a conceptual representation mm -hmm. of that, uh, especially in this moment of social media. I mean, like also, Pretty much all you have to do is go online and be like, oh, I'm from so-and-so, but it's not really that serious uh, because you can access all of these different yeah. uh, influences, if you will. Um, and in this current moment, Southern influence is still big, both sonically and culturally. So, Who else would you teach? Uh, who else would you erect a semester-long course around? If you had the opportunity, right, right give us three, cla three classics that you, classes that you would build around iconic figures. And not even just Southern rap. I mean, just from, from a pedagogical standpoint, if you could construct three classes around mm. iconic figures beyond outcasts. Eric you know. Badu. Mm -hmm. Like a how she kind of transfigures ideas of black womanhood. Um, Goody Mob. You can't, I mean, you can't really talk about Southern agency in the contemporary moment yeah. without yeah. speaking about them. Um, and a third one, I mean, this would probably be just for fun, but you know, Memphis hip hop is kind of underrepresented too. So like Three Six Mafia, Eight Ball, and MJG, right? Where does, how does their representations of Memphis poverty and life reflect in their use of the blues? Because um, mm -hmm. you can definitely hear those blues aesthetics, especially, especially in Eight Ball and MJG. So, you're watching Left to Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony. We're joined by Professor Regina Bradley who is assistant professor at Armstrong State University in Savannah, Georgia. Savannah, the seaport, yep. Boondock College, your collection of short stories. Um, <laughs> talk about that for a moment. You know, one, just from an artistic standpoint yeah. of going again, you know, uh, you know, we just sat down with Andre Carrington, right? Mm -hmm, we're talking about mm -hmm. this kind of shift from fandom to critic. Um, yeah. As a writer, what is it like to shift from the cr more creative voice um, to the critical voice? Mm -hmm. And, and are, what are the ways in which they bleed, right? Yeah. You, know, uh, you know, what does it mean to be a creative critical voice, right, in the context, particularly in the context of the work that you do that kind of demands, you know, much more of a creative way around ideas and, and, and cultural criticism? Um, actually, I take a page from your book, Mark, in terms of I can't remove myself completely from what I'm researching right. because my personal experiences often dictate the types of questions that I raise mm -hmm. in my scholarship and also what I write about. Um, so Boondock Collage is a, is a collection of 12 short stories that talk about coming of age in the South after the Civil Rights Movement. Um, and one of the, a lot of the stories kind of you know, have this arc about uh, the generational tensions between folks who were coming up in the Jim Crow era or marched in the civil rights movement. Um, and that's kind of reflective of my own experiences growing up with my grandparents. And my grandparents were definitely part of that Jim Crow era um, and were constantly reminding me that they came from the Jim Crow era, whether it was, you know, your job is those books, you need to make sure that you get this academic thing down. Um, and I'm like, yes, whatever, I'm gonna do what I want to so listen to this hip hop over here, right? Um, but they, they, they converge in, in, in useful ways because it kind of shows that it's a living space, like mm. it's a living critical mm. space. Mm. Um, and I'm very fortunate that um, I'm able to 
uh, connect those two together. So when I think about the creative aspects of what Southern studies can do, the creative aspects of what writing about a contemporary South can do is useful because it also helps to lure students in. Oftentimes I can't just throw theory at them and it's like, okay, here's the theory. Let's, let's break this down. I have to find a way to kind of lure them in. Not necessarily spoon feed, but lure them in yeah, yeah. to the point where they're like, oh, okay, now I'm actually ready for that critical aspect of it. And I often do that through my storytelling, um, whether it's on paper or in class. Like students always mm -hmm. laugh at my, mm -hmm. they always laugh at my expense, which is, which is totally okay. But um, it's something that I've, I've found to be a useful pedagogical tool as well as a writing tool to be able to say that, um, oh, I wrote this short story about X, Y, and Z, um, but I'm also an artist, I'm sensitive. Mm. <laughs> so it's often very challenging. Um, and something that I'm continuously working on is jumping from that critical language that's often uh, dragged down by academic jargon, that kind of need to, for me to feel like it has to be academic, um, and putting that in my, in my creative writing, especially like if I'm having a dialogue conversation. And I'm like, really? Will somebody really use discourse if they talking to me just off the street? No, they wouldn't. So <laughs> being able to recognize um, do a little translation. The work. translation work, yeah. yeah. And, and for me, that translation work is, is happening because I'm a creative writer. Right. So I'm going to ask you about playlist, right? Because, you know, oh, okay. we, we love playlists. Um, but I'm going to push you because I could ask you for a playlist of the five most important Southern hip hop songs. And, and you'd go, blah, 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 blah. I know you would. <laughs> but I'm going to push you. I, I'm going to ask you to think about the five most influential prototypical mm. Southern hip hop songs, right? What is there in the culture, right, prior to say like that first Outkast album mm. that becomes so influential on what becomes Southern hip hop? That ain't even right, Larry. that ain't even right. Um, I want to shout out Missy Elliott mm -hmm. because the way that she does both ends of the stick in terms of production as well as lyricism introduces a particular component of, of women's voices and how we articulate southernness both sonically and also lyrically right, right. Um, I just think that she's amazing because she's from right. Portsmouth so right. it's kind of like and of course visually right visually yeah right. I mean like the I'm better joint is ridiculous <laughs> right um, UGK I think it's also um, important to that conversation because, of course, they introduce like the pimp culture or whatever, right, but it's right. also that playing with chopped and screwed, which is right. a particular aesthetic and, associated with Texas. And, and right? you know, folks sleep on that part of it because they think about the musical part. Now, obviously, they think about, you know, what happens in the context of, of DJ Screw and, right, right. and the, the kind of tragedy around those kinds of things. But, you know, what it really is is a theoretical intervention in thinking about how Southern people live their life. Mm -hmm. And how that sounds. <laughs> right, and how that sounds. Right? How that it's sounds. a sonic representation of, of an experience, right? Yeah, I mean, like we were talking, um, in, you know, or during the break about Moonlight and how yeah. he takes that, he chops and screws the second part of the score for the film. I mean, yeah. like, that chop and screw does something to force you to slow down, literally slow, slow down, down right. and think about what you're hearing as well as what you're, what you're seeing, right? Um, Goody Mob, because their play on words is, is amazing, right? Um, their ability to tell a story. Cujo Goody has one of the most iconic voices in mm -hmm. hip hop ever, right? Um, and I also like Field Mob, I'm from the Benny. So Field Mob, just their play on words and like that intentional antithetical, you know, thought process in terms of I'm actually going to embrace my countryness. <laughs> um, embrace being anti-materialistic. And, and I mean, and that also speaks to the social economic conditions in Albany. I mean, like right. in Albany, black folks ain't supposed to make it, right? right? Um, I think they're one of the most impoverished cities in the nation, right? And actually, especially when they were coming out in the early 2000s, where it was like the era of bling bling right, and cash money. Right, right. Um, and they were like, nope, nope, we don't worry about none of that. We're actually gonna tell you about what it means to really be country and black right. and using whimsical wordplay to, to do that. And then of course, Three Six Mafia, man. Like I can't, <laughs> you know, before you got Lil Jon and Crunk and all of that, you had Three Six Mafia with Tear the Club Up, right? Yeah. Which you still can't play 20 years later because <laughs> the club, uh, we don't want it to get torn up. Um, so just, I'm mean, like, just the way that you get bodies to move, right? How bodies move, how, how that sounds yeah. in, in Southerness. And then um, you can't have any of these conversations without organized noise. Right, like I was, I was messing with you on the way here because you were listening to Society of Soul, and I was like, "What you know about that?" <laughs> <laughs> um, 
it's just the way that they literally shaped and reshaped how Southernness is supposed to sound in a contemporary mm -hmm. moment. So I mean, like you have folks like Sleepy Brown, and you can hear those connections to funk with Brick, right? right. Um, and his dad was in Brick, so you hear those 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 funk, the funk, the gospel, the blues, and then all of that articulates into this very um, funky, stank, if you will, <laughs> uh, sonic reinterpretation of what Southernness is supposed to do. We've been here with Professor Regina Bradley. Yay! Thank you for blessing us here at Left of Black. I told you I made it because I'm on the couch. This is a very <laughs> important moment for me. <laughs> Thanks Thank for, for joining us. You're Thank welcome. Thank you. Black lights and booze burn when I record for watch. And every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot. Hard black everything. Everything black. Culture over everything, y'all. We taking it back.